Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, will the real Damascus please stand up? So, uh, almost any time you see a video on YouTube that uses the term Damascus steel in the title, you'll see this little flame war breakout. Uh, people will say, you know, it's a fraudulent use of the term Damascus steel. Uh, the type of steel shown in the video is fake. It's a cheap ripoff. Uh, there's some attempt to fool people. Uh, or this is just not real Damascus. So, are the guys who make these claims correct? Uh, that is the question I will answer here today. Completely, utterly putting this whole debate to bed forever. Really. All right, so let's back up here and talk about steel. There are several ways to produce patterns in steel, uh, patterns which are intrinsic to the steel and not just somehow applied to the surface, not masked off and etched on, not painted, not carved. They're actually inside the very structure of the steel. So one of these techniques involves melting steel in a crucible. That's basically a little clay jar. And the other involves taking bars of dissimilar steels, stacking them up, heating them in a forge until they weld together, then manipulating them by twisting them or chopping them or, you know, restacking them or whatever. In either case, crucible or pattern welding, uh, you can etch the surface of the steel with an acid and it's gonna reveal the patterns that are sort of built into that steel. So, is one of these the real Damascus and the other a fake pretender or not? Let's start by talking about crucible steel first. So, starting maybe 2,000 years ago, give or take, um, crucible steel started being man manufactured in uh, South India and it was exported throughout Central Asia. Now, this steel has been referred to by a lot of names. Woots, Bulat, Pulat, Uku, uh, and also in the West, uh, variants of the term Damascus, Damask, Damascene, Damascene, uh, Damascus, and so on. So before we get bogged down in terminology, let's talk about this ancient crucible steel. What actually was it? So this form of steel was made by combining sources of iron and carbon in a small clay pot or crucible, heating it till it melted, and the carbon became distributed throughout the iron, making it into what we call steel. Now, as time went on, there came to be major industrial scale production centers in the Fergana Valley. That's what's now um, in sort of the borderlands of uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, that area, uh, and very possibly many other places uh, during the early Islamic period. Um, but not Damascus, Syria. In any case, uh, what came out of the little clay pot or crucible was a sort of biscuit-shaped um, piece of steel, a billet, uh, and they, sl they, they cooled very, very slowly. And so what happened was that large crystals known as dendrites uh, formed in the steel. And in some cases, microalloying took place uh, along the grain boundaries. And so with careful forging, uh, the evidence of those crystals, those dendrites, were preserved in the steel even as you drew it out. So by etching the surface of the steel with an acid, you could bring out this beautiful wavy pattern in the steel that was brought on by the remnants of these uh, dendritic structures that remained in the steel. And, you know, maybe by these trace alloys found at the borders of those crystalline structures. Whatever the nuances of the metallurgy, though, the point is that it was a prized effect um, aesthetically, one that European smiths were unable to duplicate, and maybe even more importantly, it was also capable of producing very hard but flexible steel. It was great steel. So why was this stuff that was called Wootz or Bulat or whatever in, uh, you know, as we went further east, uh, when, we, when it got to the west, it, it was referred to as Damascus. Now, first off, we don't know exactly when that term Damascus started being applied to this steel. Uh, that may be kind of lost in the midst of history. Um, but one thing that we do know is that Wootz, Bulat, whatever, was not actually produced in Damascus, Syria. 
Uh, but we do know that Damascus was a major center for production of swords. And uh, Europeans had contact with Damascus uh, during the Crusades and through trade and so forth. Um, whereas Fergana Valley, India, and those places during this period of time, not so much. So maybe that's the source of the term Damascus as applied to this kind of crucible steel. If so, it was a misunderstanding from the very beginning. But hey, whatever. Um, now, there are a bunch of other competing theories about what the term Damascus, uh, you know, where it came from. Uh, maybe that was a corruption of an Arabic word, uh, Damas. Um, uh, maybe uh, that there was a famous uh, Arabic swordsmith named Damaski, whose name has been applied to swords. A whole bunch of different theories, but the fact is, we don't really, really, really know for sure what the origin of the term is. So fast forward a few centuries, gun makers in India are making gun barrels by forge welding irons or steels of varying carbon content uh, as early as the 1400s. By twisting and reforging the steel, these Indian smiths were able to create really intricate and interesting patterns in the steel. And this Indian technique kind of migrated uh, west and was commonly used in high-end uh, European shotguns by at least 1800, probably a good bit before that. So what did they call this forge welding technique in the gun trade? If you look back at books uh, on European guns, a good example of this is one of the true classics of gun literature, W.W. Uh, Greener's 1854 book, uh, The Gun and Its Development. You'll find that this technique of forge welding dissimilar steels to form patterns was described exclusively by the term Damascus steel. Let me say that again. Greener, and he was you know, right in the middle of the gun trade in England uh, at its height, the exclusive term he used for pattern welded steel, and this is going back over 160 years now, is Damascus. In other words, this was a completely accepted and standard usage uh, during that period. And the same technique was also used by knife makers. Here uh, is a scientific magazine, Mechanics Magazine. This is uh, a quote from 1830. By filing semicircular grooves into the blade on both sides and again subjecting it to the hammer, a beautiful rosette-shaped Damascus is obtained. That's 1830, 185 years ago. A technique very similar to what's now known as ladder pattern Damascus. In other words, Damascus did not simply become the predominant term for what we sometimes now call pattern welded steel. It was virtually the only term. You'll never see the phrase pattern welded steel, which a lot of knife makers use today in the 19th century in you know, books about guns and knives and so forth. I mean, I haven't anyway, and I've read a lot of them. So not trying to be tedious here, but the point is that for at least two centuries, the dominant term in both cutlery and gun making for steel that's stacked, forge welded, manipulated to produce a pattern is Damascus. Now, incidentally, I've found references in 18th century uh, European books to imported South Indian steel. We're going back 250 years now. Uh, this was a common import good into Europe at the time, and it was not referred to as Damascus steel, but as Woots by European merchants. So, putting aside terminology, uh, what about the claim that modern Damascus or pattern welded steel is some kind of you know, cheap ripoff of the ancient crucible technique? Sorry, no. Uh, producing modern pattern welded steel takes just a huge amount of uh, energy, time, skill. You know, pound for pound, some of the more complex modern Damascus designs easily take more time to produce than did crucible steel back in the day, woots. So whether you like it or not, whether modern you know, pattern welded steel uh, floats your boat or not, you know, nobody rips anybody off by replacing one super expensive thing with another super expensive and difficult to make thing. That just doesn't make any sense. So let's summarize. My response to the guys who say it's fraudulent to use the term Damascus for anything other than steel objects made in Damascus, Syria out of crucible steel, yeah, no.
The word Damascus was a misnomer from the very beginning. Crucible steel is not and was not ever manufactured in Damascus, Syria. And even when it was found there, back in the day, nobody called it Damascus. They called it, you know, Wootz, Pulat, Bulat, all these other terms. Uh, so that term was concocted, Damascus was concocted by Europeans who were actually ignorant of its true origins. So, you know, to invest any emotion in this term today, it's not just that it's pedantic, it's kind of ignorant. Professionals in the cutlery and gunsmithing trades have been using the word Damascus in its modern sense, stacked, forge welded, pattern welded steel, you know, way before my grandfather was ever born, before my great great grandfather, still using the term Damascus steel in the trade. So all of that said, does the term Damascus create needless confusion between Wootz and pattern welded steel? Okay, to a degree, sure, maybe a tiny bit. But look, one thing we can say with absolute certainty is that the meaning of words evolves over time. You know, in the modern cutlery business and in the modern firearms trade, Damascus steel is a completely unambiguous term. It means pattern welded steel, period. Stacked, welded, forged, manipulated, folded, whatever. Everybody knows this. Everybody understands this. It's universal. It doesn't imply ignorance of ancient crucible steel. All professional smiths know what Wootz is, but Damascus is just a term of the trade. It's what we call it. So, is it wrong to use the word Damascus to refer to steel manufactured in a little clay jar in the Fergana Valley a thousand years ago? No, absolutely not. But if you really want to talk about that material, the most precise and technical and unambiguous word to use is Wootz, or Wootz, it's sometimes pronounced that way, not Damascus. So look, accusing professional smiths of fraudulence when they use a completely accepted and precise term with a centuries-old pedigree in their trade? Well, sorry guys, that's not a display of special knowledge, that's a display of ignorance. Bottom line, the word Damascus in the context of steel has two meanings. Neither one's right, neither one's wrong. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, here are a couple of other videos that you might be interested in. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrells Blades and check out my website, waltersorrellsblades.com, where you'll find examples of my work along with instructional videos showing all aspects of Japanese sword making, including forging and polishing, how to make hamones, and how to make fittings, scabbards, and handles for Japanese swords.